the trade cycle or uh, industrial fluctuations, uh, as Hayek uh, sometimes called them. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to show a couple of sh slideshows, one fairly short and uh, one longer. And uh, I'll alert you even at this early point that uh, both shows are posted to my website. So uh, you might want to refrain from trying to copy down text or graphs or whatever uh, on the uh, screen because uh, they'll be uh, readily available through, uh, to you later. Uh, also, a few preliminaries uh, about business cycle theory. We've heard quite a few references uh, to the theory from uh, Jeff Herbener and Hans Hoppe in earlier lectures. Uh, a lot of the lectures you've heard so far are, uh, I think of, as, as sort of background or building up to uh, this uh, particular application uh, of Austrian theory. And uh, in today's lecture, if I don't uh, rehearse uh, each of these previous points about capital and about market process and price formation and entrepreneurship, it's not because I it's not because I'm rejecting those things. In fact, I embrace them. They're they're essential for the business cycle to work out in uh, ways that I'm going to suggest uh, today. Uh, but uh, since this is a macro topic, it's uh, business cycle theory. Uh, it's conducive to a little different style of presentation, uh, but nonetheless, market process is ongoing in the background, which we'll have plenty of occasion to uh, mention. Uh, just as a matter of the literature, it might be worth noting uh, that uh, this theory uh, is often called the Mises-Hayek theory. That's uh, the preferred name by Murray Rothbard, and justifiably so, uh, I think. Uh, one first articulated it, Mises, in 1912, and Hayek has done the most uh, to uh, elaborate it and uh, give it some analytical legs uh, in his work. So it begins with uh, a relatively short statement, two or three pages near the end of uh, Mises' 1913 theory of money and credit. Uh, in 1928, Hayek wrote an article that's uh, only in the last 15 years or so been translated uh, into English on intertemporal price equilibrium and movements in the value of money. Uh, it's a quite a long article and uh, not deliberately addressing the issue of business cycles, although he has one footnote that's an amazing footnote. It has about 500 words, long footnote, and it's one of the most concise statements of the Austrian theory of the business cycle that I've seen. So that, that article is now available in English. It's in a book called Money, Capital, and Fluctuations that was published uh, in 1985. Um, but Hayek went on after the 28th article to write uh, Monetary Theory in the Trade Cycle, uh, which was a critical uh, essay largely of other theories, uh, Prices and Production, in which he introduced the famous, and some, say would, some would say infamous, Hayekian Triangle, that will get a lot of play uh, today. And then a number of articles, many of which are collected in a uh, Hayek volume called Prices, uh, no, Profits, what is it called? Prices, Profits, and Investment, or something like that, okay? One of these trilogy uh, titles. Uh, Beyond Hayek, we've seen uh, application uh, of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, uh, first uh, in the hands of Lionel Robbins, one of the easiest to read and most persuasive treatments of uh, business cycles uh, using the Hayekian uh, analytical techniques, is Lionel Robbins. Uh, he wrote uh, Great Depression, 1934, a book that he later uh, renounced, but it's still just as good. <laughs> recommended highly, and much later on, uh, Murray Rothbard wrote uh, America's Great Depression, in which he drew heavily on the Mises-Hayek theory to uh, explain how the boom of the 20s uh, necessarily uh, turned into uh, a bust. Uh, there's been a book by Gerald O'Driscoll, 1977, Economics as a Coordination Problem, where he shows a certain blend of Hayek's later writings on the use of knowledge and his early writings on capital theory and business cycle theory. And in 1990, uh, a book by uh, Mark Skousen called Structure of Production, uh, in which he gives uh, the Hayekian theory uh, quite a workout. Just recently, I've been able to publish my own book called Time and Money, 
published by Routledge, uh, which is intended to build what I call capital-based macroeconomics or uh, really Hayekian uh, theory. Uh, recent treatments of Hayek have not been all that kind to his views on capital and business cycles. Many of you might have read uh, Alan Ebenstein's recent biography of Hayek, F.A. Hayek colon biography, that's the, the title. Uh, and in it, uh, Ebenstein reports on the basis of his firsthand reading of the literature, Hayek's development of political science, beginning with about road to serfdom through constitution of liberty, law legislation of liberty and all that, gets it pretty straight as far as I can see. Uh, he gave Hayek's capital theory and business cycle theory short shrifts, just a few pages allocated to both, and got his ideas about Hayek's theory secondhand, mainly from interviews with Milton Friedman. Well, this doesn't put uh, Hayek uh, in the best light. So uh, Fried, or Lanny Ebenstein sounds very much like Friedman when he criticizes uh, uh, Hayek's theory. Uh, the one thing he did report that I think uh, that I find very endearing is uh, at the time that uh, Hayek was at LSE, and as Ebenstein says, he still had his German accent. Well, of course he did. He always had it, uh, even when. Uh, some of the uh, people in this room met Hayek uh, uh, in his late years and still had this very strong German accent. And uh, he lectured on fluctuations at the LSE, but he always pronounced it fluctuations. Uh, and the students knew him. They called him that nickname. He was known around campus as Mr. Fluctuations, it was sort of endearing. Uh, and so I, that's why I label this particular photo, which actually... Uh, was taken in uh, Menlo Park, California in, in 77 when Hayek was a visiting scholar uh, out there. Um, he also uh, reports, Ebenstein does, on Hayek's reaction to Keynes's multiplier. If you studied uh, the multiplier theory and how spending parlays itself into more and more spending with uh, decreasing magnitudes of each ripple that eventually add up to a whole multiplier and so on, uh, Hayek wasn't particularly impressed with it and had his own name for it. He called it the Peter Outer, okay, because each successive increment was a little less than the one before. I, I, I like the name, I like the name. Um, a couple of uh, preliminaries before we launch into uh, the Austrian theory, and that is that uh, when Austrians talk of cycles, uh, they meet it in a fairly uh, limited sense. Uh, there's no notion in the Austrian school that somehow the economy is beset by waves of uh, equal frequency, uh, econo-rhythms, as I like to call them. None of that. Uh, there's no basis for it uh, that it would emerge in the market process or even that government uh, would induce that kind of cyclicality. Okay? You don't have these evenly spaced waves. Uh, that's not it. But uh, it's also something more than simply shocks that the economy has to react to. There's one school of thought, uh, so-called real business cycle theory, that takes uh, cycles, or what appear to be cycles, as nothing other than shocks to the economy of one sort or another that uh, the economy reacts to, and traces out a pattern that looks, but only looks, like some kind of a boom bust or depression recovery or, or whatever. Uh, the Austrians say, no, there's, it's more of a cycle than that. Uh, the, the cyclicality derives from the, from the upper turning point. In other words, uh, a boom, an artificial boom, one that's uh, set off by monetary policy, uh, inevitably turns to bust. So you get an upturn and then inevitably, can't necessarily predict the exact timing, but inevitably you get the downturn. And it's that downturn that sort of grows out of the dynamics of the upturn which itself was induced by uh, policy rather than by, say, increased savings, that qualifies the pattern uh, as a cycle. Uh, so the theory is really a theory, Austrian theory of the business cycle is really a theory of the unsustainable boom. That's what it is. It's a theory of how a boom ignited by monetary policy uh, won't last. It's not sustainable. It'll turn to bust, right? 
uh, a contrast I like to make goes like this. It's if, if spurred on by actual saving, now this is a genuine boom, okay? The market process plays itself out as economic growth. And we'll see that in the, analytically when we get to the second uh, uh, show here. Uh, well, okay, I said what? Spurred on by actual savings. Now contrast that with goosed up by central bank policy, okay? There's a difference here between spurred and goosed. Goosed up by central bank policy, the market process does not so much play itself out as do itself in, all right? There's some inner contradictions in the process that's set in motion that eventually resolve themselves as a downturn, a bust, okay? The theory, though, is not a theory of depressions, not per se. Uh, oh, uh, the theory has some implications about the nature of the depression, what needs to happen during the depression, and that sort of thing. But it's not a depression in the sense that the theory won't explain the depth and the length of, of the depression. That's almost always dictated by uh, uh, other factors that come into play, uh, policies pursued to try to fix uh, the initial problem, uh, and so on. You'll also notice, if you're trying to link up what I do today with what you've learned in uh, macro courses or your own reading in mainstream macro, but I give very little play to movements in the general price level. You've already heard some critical remarks by other speakers of the very notion of a price level. And uh, I'm not quite as bothered by that as some others, but it, it doesn't come into play uh, in the Austrian theory, at least in any first order sort of way. Oh, yeah, if uh, the central bank tries to stimulate a boom well beyond uh, any conceivable possibility of pushing it further, uh, you'll get some pretty dramatic inflation, and the effects of that can be taken into account. But the business cycle can play itself out even in the absence of movements in the general price level. Uh, and in fact, I think that's very significant for today's application. It allows the Austrian theory to explain current uh, ongoings in the macro economy where, where some of the mainstream theorists theories are lacking simply because the inflation that is, uh, that is key to understanding some other cycle theories uh, simply hasn't uh, shown up yet. Uh, okay, I want to start with a discussion of the nature of the boom that hinges on a very unique aspect of the Austrian theory, and you've probably heard it named already. It's called malinvestment, okay? This is a wrong use of resources as opposed to overinvestment. Now, I'll show you later that overinvestment has its own role to play. Uh, but malinvestment is certainly the unique aspects. And to get you to see it, I want to take the discussion completely outside the context of a market economy so as to force you to, 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 to look at the real factors, okay? Look at the real resources. In fact, I'm going to represent the real resources of the economy as simply a pile of bricks, okay? Bricks are resources. They're not just bricks. They're the total resources of the economy. It's a question of how you allocate the bricks, how you allocate the resources over time, all right? Uh, and I've told in earlier lectures a story that, about Ivan and the brickyard, and I finally committed it to uh, a slideshow with the help of the Internet where you can actually find an old Soviet brickyard that wasn't run on market principles, okay? And that's uh, critical to the analysis. But once we tell the story in non-market terms, then you know what to look for. You see what kind of disequilibrium, what kind of distortion to look for when we then begin to talk about it in a market setting, okay? Uh, okay, let me go to my Ivan in the brickyard. And to emphasize it's a non-market setting, I'm using an old Soviet-style brickyard, which knows no markets and knows no prices. It serves only as keeper of the bricks, okay? The housing czar asks the brick czar how many houses can be built. The brick czar sends Ivan to the brickyard to count the bricks. If you know uh, anything about the old Soviet system, I mean, this is, this is pretty much on target. In fact, the czar uh, usually had a, a factor that he multiplied the reported number of resources by that was maybe 0.85 or 0.7 depending on who was counting it was called the lie factor all right because Ivan likes to tell his master uh, what he wants to hear okay 
uh, Ivan's count is overly optimistic, enough bricks to build six houses, which, of course, would, in the old Soviet Union, that would be a housing boom, okay? <laughs> but uh, five, five, we say, as omniscient uh, onlookers, uh, is probably a more reasonable number. So essentially, you have Ivan telling a lie, and, and we're going to ignore the lie factor uh, or assume that it wasn't enough to, to uh, compensate, okay? So the housing czar informs the master builder, and I take this, you'll see in a minute, I take the master builder term directly from a Mises quote, so, so it sort of plays into what Mises had to say about this situation, who then sets his workers to the task two rows of three houses each, okay? And now we have to go to the internet and actually pull up the old uh, Soviet brickyard, it's in Russia, just outside uh, Moscow. Oh, let's, let's sum up the situation by Mises first before we go to the brickyard. Look what he says. He says, consider the position of a master builder whose task it is to erect a building out of a limited supply of building materials. Well, that's the bricks, okay? If this man overestimates the quantity of the available supply, he drafts, he drafts a plan for the execution of which the means at his disposal is not sufficient. Okay, so he's trying to build a big building instead of a small one, or in our uh, example, six houses instead of five. Okay. He oversizes the groundwork and the foundation, too many foundations in our case, and only discovers later in the progress of the construction that he lacks the material needed for the completion of the structure. Now, that's malinvestment, okay? You, you, you commit too many of resources to the early stages of a project, leaving not enough to finish uh, those projects, okay? So it's obvious that the master builder's fault is not overinvestment. See, Mises is arguing against an overinvestment theory. This is a malinvestment, not overinvestment. Now, we'll see later that, that this example and Mises' example is set up in such a way as to guarantee no overinvestment. In other words, the bricks are simply a fixed quantity, a perfectly inelastic supply of bricks. Once we allow for a forward sloping supply curve, uh, we can get both malinvestment and overinvestment. That's right out of uh, human action. Okay. Now we go to uh, uh, my uh, Internet site for... Uh, the brickyard. There it is. The old Soviet brickyard. I don't know how many of you can read Russian, uh, but it says uh, brickyard. Brickyard. Okay. Uh, okay. Now that's that's what a perfectly inelastic supply curve looks like. Okay. It's just a pile of bricks. All right. And out of this, uh, we're going to build. Six houses, that's streets there, okay? Three houses and two rows. Uh, and, and the master builder sets individual builders, six of them, to building the houses, okay? And they begin drawing from the bricks pile and building houses, okay? All right, they have different styles, okay? Um, now, occasionally what we'll want to do is, is check back. Uh, uh, at the brickyard to see how things are going. Okay, well, let's see, maybe we can do that now. Let's see. Yeah, They're drawing down. Okay, but let's be optimistic about it and continue the houses. These aren't very imaginative houses. They're not uh, custom built or anything. They're, they're Soviet houses. Look a lot alike. Okay, uh, better check back. Well, it's getting kind of iffy, okay, getting kind of iffy. And you could even imagine that at this point maybe expectations would play a role in each of these, each of these builders are worried that they might not get enough bricks for their house. And so you'd have, you know, um, if I were in a market setting, I might say a credit crunch or a scramble for credit or a scramble for liquidity. But here it's scramble for bricks, okay? These people need to get bricks uh, to build the houses. Okay. Okay, we're getting there. Whoop. Oh. Well, it looks like they can't go much farther. 
Yeah. Well, I went a little farther than I thought. Well, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Well, the flag has its purpose. All right. Now, at this point, we've reached the, the inevitable downturn. All right. And, and, and frankly, in a market setting, we would have reached it before that because expectations would play their own role. And, and what's left to do? Uh, uh, but liquidate uh, at least some of the houses, pick out the two that look the least furthest along, maybe in that top row, the one on each end. And you have to liquidate those, tear them down, get the bricks uh, to finish what you can. Okay? Now, I said te tear down two, but if you remember right, we said there were enough bricks there to build five houses. But I'm sorry, if you start out trying to build six, and then you have to tear some down. You're going to break bricks, waste bricks, and so on. And you can't build even as much as you could have had you set out to build uh, five houses. Okay? So uh, let's tear down these two and finish the others. All right? There you go. So you end up with four houses instead of uh, five, which you could have had, and certainly no way you could have had six. One reason I like to show this in real terms is because all too typically, uh, when the economy is, is right teetering on the downturn or even started down uh, towards recession, such as right now, let's say, uh, economists are always called upon to ask, well, what should the Fed do now? Okay. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you focus on the real factors, you can see that the answer to that question uh, <laughs> It's not going to satisfy anybody. Okay, what can the Fed do now? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, the Fed can print uh, the economy into big trouble, but, it, but there's nothing to do to print it out of that trouble. They can't print bricks. They can only print money. All right? So there's nothing to do. Now, what I want to do here, just, uh, well, let's look. Five houses could have been built had the master builder set out to build just five. But by trying to build six, he was forced into liquidation owing to the lack of uh, sufficient bricks. Given the losses that always the company's liquidation, the master builder in the end could only complete four. And so we have it. And here, and here again, in real terms, think of it in real terms, boom, bust, liquidation, and partial recovery. All right? So the whole Austrian theory of the business cycle, when told even in a market setting, is a story about Ivan in the brickyard. All right? So don't lose sight uh, of that. Now, to make the transition from this PowerPoint show to the next one, uh, I'm going to put it on graphs. And uh, by putting it up this way, you see that vertically, uh, sh vertical supply curve. That's the number of bricks, okay, perfectly inelastic. Uh, and in that case, of course, the supply of bricks is just given. It, uh, it shows up that way in the chart. And uh, if bricks were sold, see, here comes the market. Rather than allocated by the housing czar, demand for bricks would determine the market price, as you can see, PEQ, equilibrium price of bricks. Okay. Now, I'm just going to change it by allowing the, uh, the supplies of factors of production, which would include labor, to be less than perfectly inelastic. Okay. So now it's possible, uh, actually, to produce more uh, if only because people are working more, they're working overtime, or they're, or they're foregoing vacations, or, or, or they're uh, adopting a later retirement date, uh, or they're not going to school, they're going to work instead. Okay, so there's all sorts of ways that, that uh, the inputs as well as outputs can be increased up to a limit, but it's a fairly strict uh, limit. Okay, and that's what that says there essentially. And so now with supply and demand fully in play, the market coordinates buying and selling and gives us an equilibrium price and quantity of, well, bricks still. But, but to convert this to a market economy, uh, a macro economy, uh, what we need is resources generally. And uh, what we tend to do is use the financial markets as representing the movements of resources. We generalize from bricks to investable resources and let our supply and demand depict the financial markets that mobilize those resources. So the quantity axis shows saving, that's the supply. In other words, those are the funds with which bricks and other inputs, labor, can be purchased, and the quantity, uh, and, and then uh, investment, which is demand, that's the business community's willingness to borrow the funds 
and buy the bricks and hire uh, the labor. Uh, I've put on the horizontal axis some arbitrary numbers just to show macro magnitudes, probably multiplied by a billion, 500 billion or a trillion, whatever, uh, for investment and saving this, after all, is a macro economy. And uh, who uh, knows, who can tell me what that I stands for on the vertical axis? Interest rate. What? Interest rate. Anybody else? It's Ivan. It's Ivan, okay? I stands for Ivan. Ivan needs to tell the truth. You're right, you're right. It's the interest rate, okay? But any time... Yeah. <laughs> when you see that interest rate, think Ivan, okay? And Ivan needs to tell the truth, okay? That's it. That's the story. Okay, so the I on the vertical axis, Ivan, a.k.a. the interest rate, okay? Uh, now, it's interesting here that this, uh, we could call this, you know, this is called the supply and demand for loanable funds. It's the loanable funds theory of interest that, that, that actually was the dominant theory of interest until Keynes wrote. Um, but more broadly, uh, it goes beyond loanable funds. And uh, the supply of loanable funds is, is supposed to be a proxy for the supply of investable resources. Uh, the demand for loanable funds is a demand for investable resources. Okay, so we're back to bricks, and you know, think of it in, in in real terms, with the interest rate clearing the market. And by the way, that interest rate, at least for in this context and for our purpose, is what uh, Newt Bixell called the natural rate. It's just the rate hammered out by the market, the give and take of suppliers and demanders, in the market for investable resources. So that rate can change if supply conditions change, for instance. So suppose that people want to save more. Uh, okay, I explained about the equilibrium and all that. Suppose people want to save more. It says that loanable funds reflects people's inclination to save. Uh, and it can change. People may decide to save more. It's for retirement or finance education or save up for a new car or whatever they're going to save for. Okay. And if they do, that's, that's uh, represented by an increase in the supply of savings, a rightward shift in the supply curve, which in this graph bids interest down to about 2.3, it looks like, gives you more saving, 1,000 instead of 800, gives you more investment. Uh, investors are moved to undertake those investments because of the uh, attractive interest rate, and that's what gets you genuine growth. That's when I say that if it's savings driven, the, the market process, bidding out of the interest rate and the, and the uh, uh, investments based on that low interest rate, as explained by uh, Professor Herbener yesterday, uh, gives you increased growth, all right, uh, which is consistent with the preference change. People are saving up now in order to consume more in the future, and they'll be able to do that because the economy is growing. Uh, faster. Okay, now I'll show you the alternative here. Without an increase in the supply of loanable funds, the economy's growth rate is set by the equilibrium values at 800. Okay, uh, now if the monetary expansion pushes, that should have an E in it that pushes the economy to grow faster, the increased growth rate is not sustainable. And we can see that too. It's interesting that the initial shift looks for all the world pretty much like the savings shift. You shift the supply of loanable funds to the right, but you don't shift the supply of bricks to the right. You don't shift the savings to the right. In fact, quite the contrary. Uh, well, let's read here. Pumping new money through credit markets has some effects that initially are similar to the effects of increased saving. Okay, the interest rate decreases. Investment increases. But the increased investment is accompanied by an increase in consumption. It is not funded by genuine saving. Because if you look at this uh, diagram, in fact, let me go to the next one here, which is, which is the last one, I think. Uh, that uh, I like to say that padding, whoop. Uh, let me do this again. Hit the trigger one too many times, didn't I? I'm not going to go through the whole thing. No. It thinks I am. Uh, 
Okay, it won. If that was the last one in here, I'll, I'll go to the next one. But <laughs> I say I will. Was we'll it? Let me let me get this going, and then I'll make my make my point. Uh, that last diagram that you almost saw, uh, it, it shows that, that uh, the actual amount saved actually decreases. In other words, you move down along the given saving function. You'll see that in this uh, next uh, uh, graph, too. Uh, and, and so people, far from increasing their saving, actually increase their consumption. In other words, savers, who used to get 5% for their interest, or for their uh, savings, now only get 2.3%. So why save? Or why save as much? Go ahead and spend. So here, what's going on in effect is at the very time that workers are trying to draw from this uh, pile of bricks to build too many houses, consumers are eating the bricks. Okay? They're consuming more. They're, 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 they're increasing consumption. This is an aspect that uh, Hayek himself overlooks, I think, unfortunately, because it, uh, it, overlooking it is one of the things that caused uh, confusion when he tried to sell his ideas at the LSE. Mises picked up on it. Mises said uh, that uh, the problem during the boom is malinvestment and overconsumption. All right, because at low interest rates, savers aren't as inclined to save; they're more inclined to consume, and so that exacerbates the problem. All right, that, that draws even more from the pile of resources. So we'll see that again, in, even in this uh, show. Uh, this is a show that's based uh, partly on uh, my book. It draws from chapter three and four uh, of Time and Money. And uh, significantly, it's dated 1999. And when you see the business cycle actually play itself out, uh, you'll see Bill Clinton still at the helm, which meant that when I put this together uh, in fairly early 99, I was anticipating a downturn before the end of the Clinton administration. Well, okay, I blew it. But, you know, that's consistent with the Austrian theory. Mises always says you can't predict the downturn. You can't predict when it will come. And he's right. I couldn't. Okay, I blew it. Uh, but I haven't gone back to revise it to show uh, Bush at the helm. I guess I'll be forgiven. I just call it the analysis of sustainable and unsustainable growth. It's an application of capital-based macro, which you see in silhouette here. You'll see the individual... Uh, graphs coming up. Uh, part one, the elements of capital-based macro. And here, uh, I can go over this pretty quickly because it's what we've just done. In, in other words, uh, that's the loanable funds market. That's the supply and demand for loanable resources. I have this set up with some text that not many of you can read probably, but that's fine because you've got me here you know, to tell you what it says. I'm not going to read it all, but I'll tell you what you get out of it. And if you pull it up later uh, on the web, you can uh, read through it. But this just makes the case that what's conventionally called the loanable funds market is actually understood even by its uh, proponents, Bon Beverick, let's say. And it, even Keynes understood it this way, as a supply and demand uh, for investable resources. It's a macro concept. And it doesn't really matter for our purposes whether the, those resources are made available literally through bank loans or through equity shares or retained earnings or whatever. Okay, uh, it, it's a uh, supply of investable resources. Uh, interestingly to me, this diagram and this diagram alone is included in Keynes's general theory. If you flip through his general theory, you don't see any graphs, none, except this one. And he put it in at Roy Herod's suggestion because Herod told him when he read an earlier draft, he says, Maynard, are you saying that you're actually rejecting the loanable funds theory of interest? And Cain said, yeah, that's it. That's what goes. He said, well, you better make that clear or your reader won't believe it. So Keynes put the graph in and rejected it. Okay, this is not any part of his own theory, but it's part of Hayek's theory. Uh, and we'll see how it works. Uh, a second element in this uh, capital-based macroeconomics is a very familiar curve. It's called the production possibilities frontier. 
uh, with consumption spending on the vertical axis, investment on the horizontal axis. It shows how you can use the brakes. You can eat some and use some for investment purposes, or at least that applies to resources generally, where some of them are consumable. Uh, the curve itself, the curve itself identifies combinations of consumption and investment that are sustainable, that can be produced over a sustainable period, right? Uh, it doesn't suggest that anything beyond the point is somehow metaphysically impossible, okay? We could be beyond the point by working uh, 12-hour days and seven-day weeks and not taking vacations and so on, all right? But economically, uh, in other words, production that, that accords with people's preferences for leisure and labor uh, will give us this production possibilities frontier, okay? Uh, in fact, that's what I explain here. So anything beyond the curve is unsustainable combinations of consumption and investment. And of course, you get so far out, and it really literally is impossible. But the rele economically relevant region is beyond the frontier that's not sustainable. If you're below the frontier, well, you're in a depression, right? You've got unemployment. If you're on the frontier, that's full employment, right? Um, I indicate that investment is reckoned in gross terms. In other words, some of the investment is just used to maintain capital equipment. Uh, and, and so if, if all the investment uh, just maintains capital equipment, let me see, let's go here. No, that's the other one. Let me go back for a minute. Uh, if all of the investment is used to maintain capital equipment, then that PPF will just sit there. But if you can have some gross uh, investment that's in excess of what's required for capital equipment to be maintained, then the curve itself will shift out over time. I mean, that's the standard interpretation of PPF in any case. We'll see more of that shortly. Um, I'm going the right direction now. That's the Hayekian triangle. And uh, we've heard some about that from Professor Herbener. Uh, you can think of it broadly in terms of uh, Ivan in the brickyard, but in that example we had full vertical integration where you stayed with the house for the whole time. In high X prices in production, you get multiple stages of production in different industries, different firms working in different stages, <coughs> and resources being allocated among firms depending on which stage they're in and so on, in accordance with the interest rate. So that'd be the more appropriate interpretation here. Uh, so production time is measured um, is measured uh, horizontally here. You can think of it as going from mining to refining to manufacturing to distributing to retailing and so on. And at the end of the process, you get consumable output, okay? Uh, there's two interpretations of this. We can literally think of the processes of unfolding through time, okay? Uh, in which case, we're just telling a story like I've been telling it. Or we can think of in an ongoing economy, each of these processes occurs simultaneously. I could take you on a field trip this afternoon and show you some of this stuff going on today, all of it, you know, some retailing, some mining, some refining, and so on, going on today. Which means that we can meaningfully talk about the allocation of resources out of early stages or out of late stages into early stages without suggesting time travel, okay? You just quit working as a clerk at Sears and start working in the mines or something. All right. Um, the uh, slope uh, of that hypotenuse reflects the rate of interest, as we'll see uh, shortly here. I'll ask more about that. You can write forever uh, on the Hayekian Triangle. And here I'm showing labor markets, two of them, uh, just indicating that it's not meaningful in the Austrian theory to talk about the labor market as Keynes does. Uh, in fact, I call Keynesian theory labor-based theory. Uh, but in, in uh, Hayek's theory, uh, changes in the interest rate will have differential effects on labor markets depending on whether they're in early stage or late stage. And if you don't at least separate them into two stages, I use five, but in this show I use two. If you don't separate them into different stages, you'll miss that differential effect. And it's only if you pick it up do you actually see how the business cycle plays itself out. Okay? So... In part two, we can go through fairly quickly. We're just going to go around the horn and integrate what we've already done, okay? Starting again with the loanable funds theory, and here I've actually marked the equilibrium 
saving equal investment that's brought about by an interest rate of 5%. Um, a production possibilities frontier, which given that 800 billion probably of the resources are being devoted to investment, that leaves, oh, it looks like 2,200 billion, whatever it is, for uh, consumption. Okay, so that, that's consistent with the frontier. And we start the analysis with the economy on the frontier, with the economy fully employed, with the economy not suffering the kind of problems that we're going to attempt to explain. Uh, Keynes was critical of Hayek. He says, oh, well, that Hayek, he assumes full employment. All right. And Hayek's point goes with the methodological point. You, you better not assume you already have the problem you're trying to explain or your theory won't be able to explain it. No theory can explain its own underlying assumptions. So if you want to explain how unemployment associated with the depression emerges, you better start your explanation with an economy that's not suffering that problem and then show what can happen to cause it to suffer that problem. Okay. There's the production possibility or the Hayekian triangle. And what you can see is that the output of that Hayekian triangle uh, aligns with uh, consumption spending on the uh, production possibilities frontier. So we get uh, an integration of the elements. The one link that is not explicit, but you should recognize, is that the 5% interest, here, where's my arrow? This 5% interest here is the same rate of interest that reflects, that's reflected by the slope of the hypotenuse on the Hayekian triangle, okay? So at a lower rate, that Hayekian triangle is gonna flatten out or at a higher rate, it's gonna steepen up. Because uh, resources are going to be allocated in just the way that uh, Professor Herbener explained uh, the other day. Okay. Oh, okay. There's my labor markets. Uh, and so I look, I just sort of sample a late stage and an early stage so you can see what's going on at labor markets at the same time. Uh, let me back up and just see what if I missed anything. Uh, okay, so the initial full employment equilibrium is defined by the loanable funds market, the PPF, the Hayekian Triangle, and uh, then the labor markets, okay, uh, which, are, which I treat as auxiliary, but, the, but they are two different labor markets that can move differentially, okay? Uh, here we go. Now, just to show you how this works, let's assume that the rate of depreciation is 600. In other words, less than the current rate of investment of 800. And I've marked that up here on the, uh, on the PPF. So here is the, uh, the whole setup. Whoop, okay, what we're doing here, let me go back. Uh, what you can see is going on is, is we've got depreciation of 600. We've got investment of 800, so there's 200 net investment, which means the economy can grow, which means the PPF expands outward from period to period. And the other curves uh, expand uh, in sympathy with them, okay, that they, that, that they all shift out. Okay, it's just secular growth. It's not induced by saving or bank policy. It's simply the ongoing rate of growth that's possible by the raw fact that more investment's being undertaken uh, than is needed for uh, offsetting depreciation, okay? So watch the economy grow, okay? There it grows, okay? That's sustainable growth, okay? Sustainable growth. Uh, it says, to the extent that the increased wealth and income reduce the premium on present consumption and hence increase the propensity to save, the interest rate will fall and the economy will grow even faster. In other words, people are more wealthy, they actually save more than what's suggested here. And so I turn now to what happens with it when there's an increase in saving for whatever reason. You know, people want to save for retirement or they want to save more for children's education uh, or whatever it is. So saving is a basis for sustainable growth. All right, let's look through this. Once you get this set up, uh, the argument pretty much uh, articulates itself. You see how it works, that if there's an increase in saving, that's just a shift in the savings function to the right, okay, the, the, the increased supply of saving. And what that implies in terms of the production possibilities frontier is a movement along the frontier, okay, more investment, less consumption, all right? So that movement is very much consistent with the increase in saving. When you say increase saving, you decrease consumption, okay? 
And moving along a curve is, is precisely that. Decreased consumption uses resources freed up by that for increased investment. Right? Uh, interestingly, that's the kind of movement that can never, ever happen in a Keynesian framework. All right? Uh, look at whatever level, whether it's, whether it's Keynesian cross, ISLM, aggregate supply, aggregate demand, you name it. You draw the, you draw the figures or you write the equations uh, and you'll find that there's no scope whatever for the economy moving along a PPF. It can only move beyond it, in which case you get inflation, or it can move inside of it, in which you have depression, or if you're so lucky, it can sit right on the PPF, but don't count on it. All right? Uh, in the Hayekian view, it's possible actually for the economy to work. All right? You can move along the PPF. Uh, we can see what this looks like by uh, looking at the triangle. What do you expect that triangle to do? It's going to get flatter. Okay, so in other words, initial decrease in consumption. So the vertical distance is smaller. And uh, an increase in the horizontal distance, which means that the more roundabout processes are now worthwhile to, to produce output in the future. In the future, when people will actually be spending out of those increased savings. People are saving up for something. And uh, if you uh, undertake production activities... Uh, now, in early enough stage, you'll have that uh, ready for them. It requires some entrepreneurship here, okay? And you can also see what's going on with the uh, labor markets, and you can see why we need more than one labor market. I can't say what's going on with the labor market, because if you look at that structure of production, you say, well, you need fewer workers in the late stages because demand is down there. It's called derived demand. People aren't buying as much at Sears anymore. They're really not. And you don't need the sales personnel. So demand for labor goes down there. Derived demand. But then the discount effect works the other way. At, at early stages of production, the interest rate is a very significant factor in production decisions. And a low interest rate will cause demand for factors of production, including labor, to go up there. So you get a differential effect like that. I don't know if you can see that all the way to the back, but the demand shifts to the left in the late stages, shifts to the right in the early stages. And that, of course, gets glossed over totally in, in the Keynesian view, in the monetarist view, in the new classical view. Okay? It's just gone. So now, uh, just to give you a warm feeling, let me clean up my diagram and show you a market at work for you and for me. All right? Uh, this is what Keynesian, in, in effect, denied. can happen, period. But it can in this one. Okay, watch the economy respond to an increase in savings. See there? Okay. You want to see it again? <laughs> watch the economy respond. Everything works, okay? All right? Now, that's not because Hayek was sort of a pie-in-the-sky believer that markets always work, but Hayek said as a methodological point, that before you can explain why things go wrong, you better understand how they could ever go right. Okay? And here is an explanation of how uh, they could go right. right. Now, in the name of time, I'm going to skip. Let me go to my... No, that's not going to do it. Let me try it this way. No, maybe my time is... Okay, we'll do it this way. Uh, I've got the economy now responding to an incre increase in saving. And what I'm going to do now is... Well, watch the economy grow now. You see, it's going to grow faster because investment is greater. Because people are saving, right? So now when you get the savings, it's going to grow faster, all right? Which is, which is very consistent with the idea that people are saving up for something. In other words, at some time in the future, it might not be too long, people will actually be consuming more than they would have had they not engaged in the initial saving. In fact, I show that in a little diagram here where the hollow arrows show how the economy grows before that initial increase in saving and the other arrows show how fast it grows when spurred on by increased Saving. Okay. Now I want to try to skip, but I don't. Uh, I can do this on my computer, but I don't see how I do it on this one. Oh, is it go? 
up. Well, I can still do it then this way. See, I'm trying to save time, and you can see what that's buying me. But you're right. It's, it's the go I want, which is different on this computer than it is on the other one. I'm also messing with one of these little pads here. See how much time we're saving? <laughs> it's going to give me a slide navigator here. If I don't foul it up, I'll get just what I want. Now, if I, if I could only remember... <laughs> Didn't Hans talk about uncertainty? Okay, we did save time. Yeah. Uh, I'm passing over a segment on legislating low interest rates and going on to manipulating interest rates with money because that's hardcore business cycle theory and that's what I want to be able to spend a little time on. Okay. Um, so there's a, a, a lower interest rate imposed on the market by direct legislation has a negative effect and one that becomes apparent almost immediately. That's the segment I skipped over. But you can imagine how that works. You can show it on your own. A seemingly positive effect, though only a temporary one, can be achieved if the interest rate is lowered not by an act of Congress, but by an act of the central bank. And here this, this process is so totally different in consequence, but looks so similar in terms of market signals. And that, that's what gives rise to the cycle. That if, if people react to uh, market prices like uh, good Austrian economists think they do, then they're going to get in trouble if, well, if Ivan is telling a lie. All right? So you haven't seen any, anybody involved really in this whole process. It's just the market at work. Okay? Things are different now. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you see that... <laughs> You know that strange things are going to happen. Okay. <laughs> the economy is about to get goosed up. And look how similar that looks. An increase in the supply of credit. Well, it is an increase in the supply of credit. But it's not an increase in saving. Okay. And the effect, now there's that wedge that, that uh, eluded us on the last show. Uh, look at the two blue arrows on the wedge. Uh, that... Padding the supply of loanable funds with newly created money drives a wedge between saving and investment. It causes investors to want to borrow more because the interest rates lower. It causes savers actually to save less because they're getting such little interest. They'd rather spend. Okay. Uh, let's see what that looks like upstairs here. And here is where you get the contradiction. I've shown two hollow points there because different market forces are pulling in different directions. If investors had their way, they would be pulling along the frontier towards more investment. But if consumers had their way, they'd be pulling in the direction of more consumption because they're getting so piddly little for interest. They don't want to save. Okay? And as it turns out, that there's scope, there's a time when both can have their ways. In other words, the economy isn't so tightly geared as to preclude expansion of both investment and consumption, but guess what? It's not sustainable. All right. The economy is overheating. OK. You got. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, to, to mainstream economists, I don't have to explain that very much. But uh, uh, some uh, Austrian economists want to be wedded to the frontier. So I, I feel like I need to say a few things. So look here uh, at the bottom. Oh, I, I use the terminology tug of war. OK. I like this terminology. You get a wedge below. You get a tug of war above. OK. Together, consumers and investors push the economy beyond the PPF. The policy-induced combination of consumption and investment is unsustainable, unsustainable, dot, 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 but what? Well, it turns out, can't you guess that the administration is going to be there to claim credit for how well the economy is doing? Okay? The economy is growing. It's doing great. It's, it's beyond the frontier. What can you want, you know? So you get... Uh, Okay. <laughs> but it's politically popular. 
In fact, here's where you see that that, that overconsumption plays a vital role. Because if you didn't get the overconsumption, it wouldn't be politically popular. If, if all you got was malinvestment and pulling away of resources that people wanted to consume, you think they'd be cheering for Bill Clinton? Lord, no. They're cheering for Bill Clinton because they do consume, but they're consuming the very resources that are needed to complete all the projects that have been started. Okay? That's the rub. That's the rub. All right? Well, let's go on. This show does eventually end. Okay? There's the triangle, and now what's going to happen to it? Well, there's a tension here. It's, it's being pulled uh, both ways. And you can see why, because this, this lower part down here is going to show you the malinvestment. The, the, you're, you're starting projects that are too long. You're, you're driven by interest rates that are uh, uh, very attractive, but it's not going to last. At the same time, uh, what resources there are are being, whoop, yeah, what resources there are are being drawn away for consumption purposes. That's that top little sliver up there where it shows that consumption actually goes up. Uh, and, and that doesn't cut against the theory. It makes the theory stronger because, because it means now resources really are going to be lacking uh, because they're being consumed at even a faster rate while you're trying to undertake even longer processes. Okay? And so here's, there's all the terminology there. Uh, you have a wedge uh, in loanable funds, you have a tug of war uh, in the PPF, uh, and you have uh, structured production that, it, that shows malinvestment, also overconsumption. Mises uses the phrase over and over again malinvestment and overconsumption. Okay? And you see them both here. The overconsumption part gets uh, neglected in Hayek and other accounts, but it's in Mises. Okay? Now, what I want to do is show you. What happens is essentially is when the when you get the bust, in other words, when it becomes clear that you can't finish all the houses, and you get the bust, you go back to the frontier, but you don't go back to the same point where you were because there's a strong investment bias uh, uh, in the in that path uh, because of the low interest rate, and so even if you get back to the frontier, it's the wrong point, and worse yet, that's the very point where the Fed and policymakers generally are going to be trying to do all sorts of things to fix it. And almost anything they do, as we learn from reading, say, Rothbard's America's Great Depression, is wrong, is perverse. It, it, it causes the economy uh, to deflate even further. Okay? And, and so here we get the economy caving into uh, deep depression. Now, notice that the theory itself doesn't explain how long that blue arrow is. How far does it go into depression? Well, it depends on how perverse policies are. Okay? But what we can see is that the whole Keynesian theory is a theory about moving along that upward sloping blue arrow. Okay, moving down or up. That's all the Keynesian theory is about. Okay, it ignores the whole uh, sequence that got us there uh, in the first place. All right. So we get overinvestment, forced savings. And in fact, to the extent that blue arrow moves up a little bit at the beginning, that's actually overconsumption. So overconsumption, overinvestment, forced savings, malinvestment is the wrong mix, and eventually caving into depression. Okay. Then you get this, what's, what even Hayek called a secondary contraction, meaning that that really wasn't essential to the theory, but that would happen if things got out of hand. And you really can get a, a spiraling downward of income and expenditure. Well, like Keynes said, but, but, but Keynes only saw that part of it. He saw that's the way economies work. They spiral up, they spiral down. Okay, That was it. Uh, and here we see it really as just sort of a tag story uh, at, at the end of the story of uh, boom and bust. Okay, So you get boom, bust, and depression. Okay, Now, once more, once more. I'll clean it up for you and allow you to see it, a business cycle unfold before your very eyes with one click of the mouth. Well, two clicks. Okay. Uh, I'll do it twice. Okay. But here it goes. Here's your business cycle. Yeah. Boom and bust. Okay. Boom and bust backwards. Okay. Let's do it once more. Okay. Okay. Boom and bust. Uh, at this point, all there is to do is survey the aftermath. 
I guess I should have Bush there. Okay. Oh. I'm sure he's got an explanation. <laughs> that finger keeps getting longer. <laughs> okay. The sixth and final part is short and, and virtually self-explanatory. Don't grow the economy. Don't goose it up. Just let the economy grow. Okay. Just let the economy grow. You get sustainable growth. Okay. Try to make it grow faster.